and is intended to explore California's trade relationship with countries from around the world. Uh, we're going to examine California's complex method of taxing multinational businesses with an emphasis on how California can foster foreign investment here and how to uh, allow our homegrown uh, California businesses to expand both here and abroad. Uh, as all of you know, right now, uh, we're going through some very hard times here in California as well as uh, other places throughout this country and around the world. Uh, here in California and in my county, Orange County, unemployment continues to be uh, stubbornly high, so I believe we have to do everything we can to explore every and all opportunities to create jobs and economic opportunity for our California residents. Uh, and as you know, California is a leader among uh, high-tech and biotech industries around the world, and we need to continue to foster uh, these industries here locally. Uh, perhaps less well-known is a huge presence uh, uh, in California of investments and jobs directly attributable to companies uh, that are foreign owned or, or have foreign headquarters here in California. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Californians are actually employed in California uh, by firms, uh, international firms. If I can, today we're going to break up uh, this presentation into three panels. The first panel will consist of a Water's Edge tax expert presentation uh, with the Franchise Tax Board, uh, and they'll give us a historical overview of uh, Water Edge law and uh, California's method of taxing multinational companies uh, and how Water's Edge has evolved. Second panel uh, uh, will have uh, distinguished representatives from some of our most important international trading partners and they'll provide us with their perspective on the importance of water edge and how that plays into cultivating international trade. And finally, our third panel will include representatives from a broad spectrum of California firms, uh, high-tech, biotech, uh, as well as health-related uh, industries, and they'll speak about the implications of the water's edge law for their businesses and why we should maintain water's edge uh, for the future growth. Uh, look forward to this very interesting presentation. And finally, at the end, if we have time, I will open it up for public comments, should we have any. Uh, if I can start, I'll ask the Franchise Tax Board to please step up. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carl Joseph. I'm the Assistant Chief Counsel for the Multi-State Tax Bureau uh, for the Franchise Tax Board. My uh, bureau deals with issues involving uh, uh, the unitary method of taxation and, uh, of course, Water's Edge falls into that uh, bailiwick. I was asked so to... I presume to Water's Edge doesn't refer to Newport Beach property. <laughs> no, well, in a way, maybe. It, you know, it, it's sort of a colloquial term for essentially looking at activities that happen only in the United States. So the okay. water's edge could, in fact, you know, you could look at it as saying that Newport Beach would be the water's edge, except for Hawaii, perhaps. Um, by way of background, I think uh, since I was tasked with giving you a historical uh, perspective on where this all came from, that, uh, that sort of gets you going on how far back in time do you really want to start? Because, you know, the California history with taxing corporations is a long one. Uh, what I decided to do in the little handout that I gave you is I started with, uh, I went back to in the 20s and 30s, California made the choice to look at corporation income in California, not by looking at the separate books and records of California activity, in other words, sales that happened here or expenses that happened here, but instead to do something called the unitary method. The unitary method uh, is a recognition that activities that happen inside the state and activities that happen outside the state are all necessary for a business, one business enterprise, uh, to earn the income that it, that it earns. And then the values of that enterprise, rather than looking at separate accounting books and records, should be uh, determined in the various states where it does business by looking at the activities that take place in the state. The typical way of doing this is by looking at uh, uh, 
the amount of property it has in the state versus property everywhere, the amount of payroll it has in the state versus payroll everywhere, and then, of course, sales in the state versus sales everywhere. These are essentially proxies to sort of try to get a sense as the, to the level of activity of that business enterprise in the state. Now, this uh, method, which started in the late 20s and 30s, culminated uh, in a decision uh, by the California Supreme Court in 1941 in a case called Butler Brothers, and I gave you a little quote from there, from the case that basically said, if there's any evidence to sustain a finding that the operations of the appellant in California contributed to the net income derived from its entire operation in the United States, then the entire business of the appellant is so clearly unitary as to require a fair system of apportionment, apportionment's the use of property, payroll, and sales, by the formula method to, in, to, in order to prevent overtaxation to the corporation or undertaxation by the state. Okay, so at that point now, California is utilizing a method uh, that essentially looks towards not only things that happen here, but everywhere in the United States, perhaps, of a business enterprise. Now, the important thing to remember is a business enterprise can be run as divisions under one corporation, where you have just one corporation with offices in various places, or it can choose to operate as separate corporations in separate states. Under the unitary method, that's a distinction without a difference. We look to the business enterprise, not its legal form. So you could have a company that has a separate corporation in California, a separate one in Nevada, a separate in, you know, in all 50 states if they wanted to. And if they were all doing business as a unitary business under certain tests laid down, like in this Butler Brothers case about the operations being all unitary together, the use of you know payroll and things, the operations, the employees all work together, that it doesn't matter whether or not they choose to operate in various corporations or as one big corporation, it's still economically one enterprise. So time goes on and that's fine, you know, the, other states utilize this method as well. And by the time you get into the 60s, you start to see some indication historically that California is starting to not only look at the business enterprise that exists just in the United States, but now we're looking at the business enterprise wherever it happens to have an activity. As long as it's still one unitary business, flows of value are going back and forth, common operations, you know, perhaps steps in a vertical structure like a uh, drilling oil out of the ground in one company, refining it in another and selling it in another one. You know, as long as they're all in one uh, business enterprise, now we're looking not to just the United States, but take it to its logical extension anywhere in the world. Uh, the first case, I believe, that really sets down that as being something that was consistent with that unitary principle, I believe, was published at least, was this uh, appeal of Beecham, which went to the State Board of Equalization. And it was a case involving years in the 60s, but it came out in 1977. And in that case, uh, the board, in I don't think very surprising opinion, basically said, foreign source income is no different from any other income when it comes to determining by formulary apportionment the appropriate share of income of a unitary business taxable by a particular state. It does not involve this taxation of foreign source income any more than does apportionment involve taxation of income arising in other states. In both situations, the total income of the business simply provides the starting point for determining the in-state taxable income of the taxpayer. And that's true. Essentially, what you have when you do the unitary method, you can think of it, uh, well, the, the way I usually describe this to our, our, our new attorneys is you have questions involving uh, if you think of income as a pizza pie, you take all the income of the unitary enterprise from wherever it happened in whatever form it happened, and that gives you your size of the pizza. California cannot tax the entire pizza pie. Constitutionally, we can only tax a portion of that pie that's fairly related to activities that take place in California. Well, the constitutional law requires that the way in which you do that is through formulary apportionment, which is as I said earlier, historically, property in the state versus property everywhere, payroll in the state, payroll everywhere, and sales in the state, sales everywhere. So your size of that pizza pie is going to vary based upon the size of the business enterprise. If it's just in the United States, it'll just be the U.S. operations. If it's worldwide, it's going to be a really big pizza pie, but of course, California's slice of that pie might be very, very small because there's lots of payroll, property, and sales that are taking place 
in places other than California. It could be, you know, anywhere in the world. So typically as the pie gets bigger, the slice gets smaller, and California gets a very small piece of a very big pie when we're working at a worldwide operation versus something that's a much more local business where you were getting a larger piece of a smaller pie. So this proposition in Beecham was not that surprising. Maybe it was at the time, but it certainly isn't anymore. Now, of course, what this means is you have activities that are taking place outside the United States, in the case of a worldwide enterprise, where those activities that are taking place over there have really no taxable presence in California. They may have no taxable presence in the United States at all, yet we're going to bring them in to that size of the pie that I mentioned. Well, this concept was a little outrageous, especially to foreign uh, governments. The idea that California would be looking to activities taking place in foreign countries in order to determine the amount of taxable income in California, well, this is very different from the way federal taxation works. Federal taxation is much more based on separate accounting. If you are a, a U.S. firm, then your income from wherever you operate is in the base for U.S. tax. If you're a foreign company, you know, with some exceptions, you don't have a taxable presence in the United States. And in fact, if you do, then usually there's a tax treaty that tells you, you know, how the income is going to be taxed between the two, you know, uh, sovereigns. Uh, so this idea that California was going to look to this income in foreign locations was, you know, seen as shocking, I think, to a lot of foreign uh, governments. So, uh, as I put on the bottom of page one here, in 1977, the first attempt was made in a U.S.-U.K. tax treaty negotiation to deal with this problem of California looking to the worldwide activities of a unitary business. And in that treaty, there was a provision that prohibited the states from taking into account income of a related foreign corporation. Okay. This was essentially a, a, an opportunity or a chance for the government to step in and say, this federal government, states, don't do this. Well, uh, it didn't get into the treaty. It didn't get ratified with that section in place. That section was taken out. There's a bit of a historical story about that. I was not obviously around at the time. Uh, but essentially, there was a push uh, and pull from, from various states and, and uh, um, uh, with the federal government about whether or not that's something that the federal government should get involved in, sovereignty of states and such things. Uh, okay, so foreign, uh, by the late 70s, you have foreign governments clearly aware of California utilizing this worldwide unitary method, looking at activities everywhere to determine the size of that pie and then taking our little tiny slice. Um, in the early 80s, there's started to be bills introduced in the state legislature to limit the scope of that method. Uh, the bills were not successful at that time. Uh, there's a lot of concern about revenue. There's a lot of concern about um, the ability of companies to, to, to uh, uh, move money back and forth between various parts of their unitary businesses and things of that nature. By 1983, when I get on to page two here, um, the issue bubbles all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, there's a case called Container Corporation. Container Corporation was a U.S. company that had subsidiaries all over the world. California utilized the worldwide method. We looked at all their income everywhere, used the formula apportionment method, took our little slice, taxed them. They said it was unconstitutional. Those foreign operations should not be subject to tax in their mind in California went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and long story short, the U.S. Supreme Court held worldwide combination was, in fact, constitutional. It was fine. Uh, again, not, not too shocking when you look at a case like Beecham, where, where the board's saying, you know, there's lots of companies that aren't taxpayers in California that are included in a, in a unitary method com combined report. You don't have to be a taxpayer to determine that your income's in the slice of in the, in the size of the pie. It doesn't shouldn't matter whether or not you're talking about a foreign corporation in the sense of a U.S. corporation that doesn't have activities in California, or a foreign corporation in the sense of from another country. Well, that's kind of what the Supreme Court 
holds in container. They say, it's fine. The formula method is really the, the key to this. As long as it's a unitary business, factually, there's flows of value. You know, the business is operating as one enterprise. You utilize the formula method, not a problem. Well, after container was decided, now things really heat up. Foreign governments are really upset. <laughs> and so uh, there's a lot of effort to do something about worldwide combined reporting. Um, in my little uh, uh, handout here, I said uh, I included that the United Kingdom, Japan, Canada, the Netherlands all complained about the decision to the federal government. M something must be done. In fact, there was even talk of, I think, from the UK about retaliating against the United States or, or California in particular. Uh, because of this opinion, either yanking businesses out, charging some tariff, whatever, you know, very upset. Um, the Treasury Department then uh, formed a working group to address the issue, and this working group worked from through 83 and 84 to kind of come up with maybe, you know, some solution to this. Uh, no solution actually was ever made at the federal level. Certainly the federal government could have solved this problem, but they didn't. Uh, instead, what happened was uh, the product that turned out turned out essentially at the end of the day to be legislation in California to do something called a water's edge election. Uh, what that basically was was, was a, sort of a compromise, uh, allowing a business enterprise to file a form with the state saying, I do not want you to look at my worldwide business when determining that size of the pizza pie. You just look at, certain, at the stuff that happened in the United States, and I, can I should be able to elect to have you do this. Get my foreign operations out of my California return. That's what they want. You know. um, well, that legislation in 84 didn't make it. Uh, for various reasons, again, revenue is an issue and other things, state sovereignty still. Uh, by 85, it comes back, still doesn't make it. By 86, now we have the first Water's Edge bill, and it is successful. Water's Edge comes into the code for the first time in 86. Now, through 1986, 87, 88, I think the first year you actually could file a Water's Edge return was 88. There were variations and things tweaking the system. Uh, the original system basically was set up where you would make the election, you would pay a fee for the election, and then the election was like a contract and you were stuck with it for a period of time. I think the original term was five years, and I think for a while it was up to ten. Um, but at any rate, so, so now we have the water's edge method and things kind of, you know, calm down. That, that, that's good. There's still an unanswered question, though, and that is, is worldwide combined reporting okay or constitutional, I should say, when you're talking about an enterprise where it's a foreign parent with operations in the United States through subsidiaries? Container was the opposite. It was a U.S. company. Well, that case uh, went was going up through the system in 91, 92, 93 in a case called Barclays, PL, Barclays Bank PLC versus Franchise Tax Board. As that case went through uh, the litigation, there started to be some pressure for some additional changes in the Water's Edge scheme to make Water's Edge even more palatable to the foreign governments. And the concern, I believe, at the time was that when Barclays made it to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, whether or not uh, the Clinton administration would come out and write a brief uh, against the state of California saying, you know, this should be something that the sovereign, the, the United States government should only be able to deal in these international matters, or whether or not they would write something favorable to California and therefore kind of help California in, it, in its case. Uh, in order to sort of make things a little more palatable and to calm down the opposition there, uh, there was additional work done on the Water's Edge method. One of the things that happened is the fee went away. Um, the term of the election changed a little bit. It went from five to seven years. There were some other things that were changed in there. And the foreign governments, for the most part at that part, were pretty happy with it. You know, they, they really didn't, they could live with it. They weren't being charged a fee to do this. It allowed them to get out of it if they didn't like it. If, of course, you know, the, uh, the having everybody be worldwide was helpful to your business tax in California, you didn't have to elect. So that's good, sort of a you know, you do the math, you determine whether or not you pay more tax one way or the other, and then you make the determination whether or not you want to make the election. This is all good. Um, 
so now the U.S. Supreme Court hears Barclays. There's a brief uh, from the Clinton administration and amicus in favor of, of the state. California wins in Barclays. They say, again, this is fine. It's not a problem. There's their treaty concerns. You know, the U.S. government can deal with those, and, and it's fine. So by 1994, Barclays is decided, and now we're all sort of kind of set in more or less the framework that we have uh, today. Um, the Water's Edge election is in place. If you're a foreign entity, you know, you would be outside if you choose. So that's sort of the background history on, on, on where, how we got to more or less the system that we have today. Uh, the next page I gave you is sort of a visual representation, and this is my pizza pie analogy more or less. Basically, everybody has to be unitary here in the sense of there being one business enterprise. It has to have flows of value. It has to have unity of ownership and unity of use of equipment or, or of operations. So if you think of the largest, the darkest shade of blue here as being the worldwide group, without the Water's Edge election, that's the group that's income is going to be subject to the apportionment formula to determine our slice of the pie. When you make the Water's Edge election, that's no longer the group that shows up on the California return. What shows up on the California return is this lighter shade, just the Water's Edge unitary group. Okay? And included within that group, just as there would be included in the worldwide group, there are California taxpayers. Not everybody, in some cases maybe only one, but as long as the unitary business has activities in the state of California, they will be filing a return and utilizing this method. That's the long-standing law. So um, it's your choice. You know, if you can think about it, you think about it this way, if, if you have a lot of payroll, a lot of property, and a lot of sales outside the United States, and you have a small amount in the United States or in California, the worldwide method might well be helpful to you because when you take into account your entire unitary business, you might have a big pizza, but California's slice is going to be very small because the activities that take place here as a portion of everything you do, you know, you can imagine hundreds of thousands of employees all over the world, you pay less tax than you would if you just did the water's edge return and just looked at your activities that were within uh, the borders of the U.S. for the most part. So again, it's an election. You choose. And at that point, it's sort of a mathematical choice that, that each company makes. Now, one thing important here, as I've said earlier, is it's a seven-year election. You're stuck with it. Seven years is about a business cycle. So you, you basically have to live with your choice for that period of time. That keeps people from, uh, well, I guess the colloquial term would be flipping and flopping out of or into the water's edge method based upon where income is earned in a particular year. It, businesses vary as time goes on. They'll be profitable in some periods and not in others. And of course, your profitability across all the places where you do business can, can differ. And so there may well be years where a water's edge method is helpful and lowers your taxes and in years where they're not. Well, the election, the seven year election basically ties you in for a business cycle. And, and that prevents that sort of moving back and forth for basically no other reason than lowering taxes. Um, so basically that's, that's the, the, the overview of how it works. Now the last page I gave you is, and now we start to get complicated so hopefully we won't get too off track. How do we determine who's in and who's out? Um, the law basically provides that in order to be included, the first thing you always have to be is you got to be part of the unitary business. If you're not a part of the unitary business, it doesn't matter of whether or not you're part of the water's edge or not. So once you've determined that, now we've got into various classifications of entities that will be in and not in. Some of these are, once again, historical, and some of them are uh, still quite valuable or valid today. In entities that are included within the water's edge, 100%, their entire income, their entire factors, the whole business, are the first four that I've listed there. Banks and Corps incorporated in the U.S., so basically anybody who's incorporated in any state of the United States is going to be in the group in the water's edge election. They're in the soil of the United States. Uh, dis and FIS, these are certain uh, specialty type entities. They don't really exist in federal law anymore, but again, this law's been around a while now, so you have some 
for lack of a better word, some sort of dead weight here that probably doesn't get used very much. Uh, the third one, corps with 20% or more of their average apportionment factors in the United States. This one can be a little bit tricky, but bottom line, what it comes down to is if you're a corporation and you have payroll, property, and sales in the state, and when you add up your percentages of each one, you add up, you know, you say one was 10, one next one was 10, and the third one was 10, you'd have 30 divided by the fact there's three factors, you'd have 10% of your activity within the United States. If that number reaches over 20, then that entity gets included in the water's edge return in its totality, okay? Because it has enough activities in California, not in California, but in the inside the water's edge uh, that it is now deemed to be part of that U.S. water's edge group. Um, so this is sort of a rule that says at a certain level you tip the point and regardless of where you are incorporated, you've got enough going on in the U.S. that you should be in the return. That's what that is essentially saying. Uh, the last one, export trade corporations, again, they don't really exist anymore. It's sort of been there in the law for a while. Um, now, those are all the entities that are in 100%. You can sort of think of it really as everybody incorporated in the U.S. plus these companies that have over 20% of their, of their payroll property and sales in the U.S. There's another classification of entities that are partly included. Yeah, things get a little complicated here, I guess. Um, the first one of these are, are companies called Controlled Foreign Corporations, CFCs. These are companies that under the federal law, this is a tie into federal code, are controlled, owned over 50% by uh, a U.S. parent or you know, um, a company such that they are deemed to be controlled by them. If you are a CFC and you have something under the federal code called subpart F income, which subpart F is a part of the Internal Revenue Code that came in in the late 60s, and it's basically income from, from assets that are very movable, things like intangibles, things of that nature. The, that's a gross oversimplification. There's a lot of rules in subpart F, but the bottom line is there was a thought back in the late 60s at the federal level that there were certain types of income that could easily be moved from one place to another and if in fact they were moved offshore as I said the federal government looks only to act you know to activities taking place U.S. corporations primarily those offshore activities they didn't want to encourage that you know tax planning however you want to look at that so they said if you have these various types of income when you earn that income in that foreign jurisdiction we will basically deem it to be dividended back to your U.S. parent and tax it now as opposed to letting it be deferred sitting in a foreign country until you decide to make a dividend. You know, a lot of times at, at the federal level, there's a lot of planning around deferral. Keep things offshore in foreign corporations as long as possible. You know, maybe there's lower tax rates, things of that nature, and only bring them to the U.S. if you absolutely have to. Defer that income. Uh, you may recall that at some point in the not too recent past, the, the feds did a uh, sort of a one-time dividend deal where you could bring in money from repatriate all these dividends from, from foreign countries. And tons of money came back in the United States that was sitting in foreign companies basically being deferred from, from, from current tax in the United States for a long time. Nothing nefarious about it. That's just the way the system works. So uh, anyway, subpart F income was this category that even at the federal level, they wanted to say, no, you can't defer it. You have to bring it in now. It's mostly, like I said, passive income, things that are moved pretty easily, uh, uh, interest dividends, uh, intangible flows, things like that. So we, we pick that up. Now, the way in which we pick it up is a little complicated. I'm not going to waste your time with it, but the bottom line is if you're an entity that is a controlled foreign corp that has subpart F income, you will be partially included in the water's edge return to the extent of that subpart F income. So you're a partial in, partial out entity. If you had other income, it it's out. The, the last one is foreign banks and corps that don't have any of the ones we talked about before but have U.S. source income. It is possible for a foreign corporation to have an activity in the United States which produces U.S. source income. Um, when that happens, they are taxed by the federal government. Uh, they have factors in the United States that are related to that. Typically, there'll be sales and some property and payroll, perhaps. And, and so what we will bring into the Water's Edge group is just that income and just the factors that gave rise to that income. Sometimes this is viewed as a deemed subsidiary. 
take a foreign company and basically pretend it's two pieces, a foreign piece and a U.S. piece, and just put into the water's edge return the U.S. piece. So at the end of the day, uh, what we try to do here is we try to get uh, a sense of well, pretty much everybody that's on the federal return in one shape or form is kind of going to be in the water's edge return. The U.S. companies, some of these special things like subpart F entities and U.S. source income. But it, it should, to a large degree, equate with what's on that federal return with, with some variance, but not too much. And again, this is seen as at least somewhat more palatable to, to entities in foreign places because they're used to that. They're used to the way the, for, the, the, the federal rules work and the way international rules work between uh, sovereigns. And so the water's edge method is closer to what they really are used to actually paying. So that's how it basically all sort of falls down. And I think we did that in the right amount of time. <laughs> very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Our next panel up. Uh our important trading, international trading partners, if we can have you come on up. Welcome. Give me about 30 seconds. I'm going to get some coffee. The organization. Uh, my name is Johannes Buchholz. I'm the managing director of the uh, German American Chamber of Commerce, and we represent uh, the interests of German industry and trade here on the West Coast. Thank you very much. My name is Nicolas Makel. I'm with the Embassy of Luxembourg in Washington, D.C. Thank you. My name is Julius Andrik. I'm the Consul General of Switzerland, covering the northwestern United States. Bart van Bolhuis, Consul General for the Netherlands. Go ahead, gentlemen. You can begin. Okay. I'll start then. Uh, being German, I'll try to be succinct and to the point. Uh, just a couple of points that I would like to uh, voice here today that I hope would be taken into consideration um, in any law that's been passed in regards to that would be tampering uh, with the Waters Edge, Waters Edge Treaty. Um, one thing in our experience with German companies is that when German companies come over to the U.S., get established in the West Coast, is that they're here for the long haul. Um, they like to set up shop, and then they like to also stick with it. Even in times when it's not that good, they would not pack up quickly and leave again. So uh, you can say that there's a certain degree of loyalty uh, when a German company sets up shop here in California. Now, another thing... Uh, that people know about Germans is that they love laws, rules, and regulation. So uh, German companies would, I could tell you that, would get probably very nervous if um, the certainty principle in taxation would get uh, slightly tampered with, um, i.e. the water's edge would get tampered with, as it would um, give them the feeling that they could not, um, um, you know, trust or, or calculate with a certainty principle in taxation in order to stay here or not. So that would be a big no-no for them. Second point would be, um, in all uh, uh, moderation, all humbleness, California is, um, I believe, number 48 on the business-friendliest um, states in the union. So it is not that much leeway uh, to begin with, uh, and uh, certainly German companies are aware of that one. 
uh, uh, that California does not have the business friendliest environment, if I may say so. Um, that regard, that's in regards to taxation laws, regulations. Nothing personal, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, the third one is uh, when I have a company coming to my office wants to get established here on the West Coast. Uh, to be all, in all frankness, the first question that they ask me isn't California bankrupt? Can we still do business here? This is just because you have partial media blips in Germany about California being bankrupt. So. Obviously, I'm quick to tell them, no, you know, it is uh, certain financial hardships, but that does not affect really business on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, it would become one more blip, so to say, uh, that the German media will most probably uh, uh, publicize in Germany that there is now this unfair, quote-unquote, uh, double taxation law in effect in California, and that would probably deter um, uh, the companies uh, more from coming here. And fourth, last but not least, um, also I think it should be taken into consideration that other states, i.e. Arizona, is trying, um, they are trying very hard to attract uh, FDIs into their, their area with uh, numerous financial and other incentives. So that would be a thing. California definitely is in competition also with other states. So these are just a couple of points maybe should be taken into consideration. Well, let me ask you um, respectfully but yeah. bluntly, so what? Yeah. How many does Germany have a big presence in California? Uh, yes. How big? How many people do you employ here in California? Uh, I would have to look it up, but I know that the just for the income tax purposes, um, in terms of average salary uh, multiplied by the average amount of employees here, uh, it accounts for about uh, four billion dollars in income and obviously Four in taxation billion dollars in, in income yeah in salary that's i've heard that the germans directly employ german companies in california employ more than half a million californians mm -hmm. i'm not sure if that's the case but i believe that is the number that i've heard yeah it depends on if it's directly a direct german company or a spin uh, you know a, a branch office of a german company and i guess my question is are there industries you're looking to move into california now that green tech, uh, solar panel manufacturers, and others that maybe this change in law, as you'd say, the uncertainty would create uh, uh, questions in, in reference to possibly investing in California? Uh, right. It's, it's, again, as I alluded to before, it's less the, um, you know, the case in point that people would, if they really look at the law, okay, this would deter me. It would be another factor that would be have more signaling power versus then um, being in terms of content would keep them from, from, uh, from coming here. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by thanking the committee for devoting time and energy to this very important issue and thank you in particular, Senator Correa, for your leadership on, on it. Luxembourg obviously uh, cannot boast the figures of your other major trading partners um, because of the sheer size of its uh, geography and its economy. It can nevertheless serve as a case in point to underline that there is no dispensable or negligible economic and trade relationship. To the contrary, the figures and the examples that I will present to you show, I am convinced, that maintaining smooth flows of trade and investment between Luxembourg and California is in our mutual interest and ultimately beneficial to job creation in these dire times. With your permission, and before turning to the figures and examples, let me start by underlining that the relationship Luxembourg has with the United States, and thus also with the great state of California, is not only to be defined by economic and trade numbers. Luxembourg and the United States have built up over the years a strong friendship and partnership on multiple levels. Luxembourg has continued to this day to commemorate with unfaltering gratitude the sacrifice of American soldiers made to liberate our country from Nazi oppression and terror especially so in the so-called Battle of the Bulge, which took place in Luxembourg in the winter of 1944-1945. Ever since, Luxembourg has been a very staunch and loyal ally of the United States, especially as a founding member of NATO. 
participating since 2002 and as we speak in the war effort in Afghanistan. Let me turn to trade and economy. Our trade relations with the United States and thus with California are excellent as well. Some examples, just to underscore this point. Luxembourg's Cargo Lux, an old cargo airline, is launch customer for the new 747-8 freighter, and it puts its old Boeing 14 747s to very good use by lifting out of LAX more than 400 tons of products made in California to Luxembourg and beyond to Europe. Over the past 25 years, Luxembourg's SES satellite operator, the, the largest satellite operator in the world, has extensively sourced its 40 satellite fleet in California. Luxembourg also exports a variety of products to the United States. Sensor technology from Luxembourg, for instance, is used in most US cars to regulate safety belt and airbag behavior. But more importantly and symbolically, the steel beams that will be used in the construction of the Liberty Towers in New York are being produced in Luxembourg. Luxembourg's historically important steel industry has specialized in very high quality steel. Turning to investment and technology transfer, Luxembourg hosts many US companies, such as Goodyear, Delphi, Guardian, and DuPont, all of them entertaining major manufacturing and R&D activities in Luxembourg. More specifically from California, companies like Cisco, eBay, PayPal, Apple iTunes, Rovi Corp, Avery Dennison, AirTech International, and Templeton Investments entertain manufacturing, banking, and service operations in Luxembourg, and some even the European headquarters. Conversely, as of 2006, 130 billion of FDI had been flowing into California from Luxembourg. That is more than from Taiwan, Korea, and China, including Hong Kong, combined. What is that again, 130? billion dollars of foreign direct investment. So $130 billion of foreign direct investment to California? Yeah. Okay, that would be in the form of what? In the form of uh, investment into the Californian economy. Companies, investment funds, or whatever based in Luxembourg invest money into California, helping Californian companies just either as uh, venture capital or... Uh, Start Venture France. capital, jobs, factories, all of the above. Exactly. So $130 billion. Thank you very much. What attracts these companies to Luxembourg? The answer lies in European history and geography. Luxembourg, as you might know, is located in the heart of Europe. Around 80% of European Union's GDP is generated in a 500-mile area around Luxembourg. American and Californian companies, in their quest for expansion and diversification into new markets, use Luxembourg as a gateway into the European single market of 500 million consumers. Luxembourg serves thus as a hub for Californian companies to do business all over the European Union. Luxembourg enjoys furthermore a unique political and social stability and its business-friendly, no red tape environment is conducive to welcoming decision makers and entrepreneurs. One of the important factors of Luxembourg's attractiveness resides also in the accessibility of key government decision makers. Luxembourg's workforce, furthermore, is multilingual, we have three official languages, plus most people mumble English like I do, and highly skilled. Now let me get to corporate taxation. Please. In 2009, the combined minimum state and municipal corporate tax rate in Luxembourg was 28.59%. I hope this will dispel the erroneous impression that Luxembourg might be considered in any serious way as a tax haven. 
Luxembourg certainly is a paradise, sir, but unfortunately not in a fiscal sense. <laughs> While the tax, the Luxembourg rate for indirect taxation, relatively high at 15% compared to California sales tax, is one of the lowest in Europe based on options offered by European Union regulation on VAT, it makes it attractive to certain business-to-consumer services and thus explains why California companies like PayPal, uh, Skype, Apple iTunes and others are present in Luxembourg. And this brings me to my concluding remarks about the importance of the Water's Edge rule and why it is essential to maintain it. U.S. and Californian companies established in Luxembourg are properly taxed in Luxembourg on their revenue generated there, and our double taxation agreement will prevent them from being taxed twice on their economic activity in Europe. An amendment to this treaty introducing the OECD information exchange standard has already been ratified earlier this year by the Luxembourg Parliament and thus for its entry into force awaits only US ratification. Certainty and predictability, and our German colleague referred to it as well, especially in the fiscal realm, are of utmost importance and businesses must be able to rely on a clear framework of rules. By agreeing to the Water's Edge rule, California had recognized the vital function of bilateral trade double taxation agreements for businesses engaged in international trade. The rationale underlying this important decision has not changed as regards Luxembourg. And thus, Senator, the government of Luxembourg urges you to uphold this feature. Doing any different in these times of crisis would ultimately be hurting California businesses and jobs, as well as those of a long-standing, loyal friend and ally of the United States of America. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, very grateful, as a representative of Switzerland, uh, to have the opportunity to express our view on this important uh, subject. I really appreciate that. Now, I skip all the niceties and the generalities uh, also, I think, to give also the other uh, speakers uh, the benefit of uh, some time to express their views. I'm also very interested, of course, as you are, particularly also to hear the private sector later on. Um, so I will not mention... Uh, uh, more general matters, like uh, I actually I wanted to tell you also about a family member who was uh, serving on the General George Patton's army in World War II and things like that. I One think you don't have members. to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted actually by way of introduction to say that we are very proud in our family to have extensive family relations with the United States since many generations. I have a photo of George and Patton in my office. Ah, come up, you're more than happy. Yeah, he was serving as a colonel. Um, in uh, George Patton's army. And we are very proud of that. When he was visiting us in Switzerland in the 50s and 60s, he was our great hero. Now that's, I think I limit two pages of introduction to that point, okay. and I come directly to economic facts. Thank you. I believe you are interested in that. It's your time, sir, as you wish. The, uh, um, now, speaking about Switzerland-United States economic relations, um, one thing to me, that is fascinating when I compare our small country with the giant economic power of the United States is that we have a couple of things in common. I see particularly a common spirit of competition and fairness. Both are market and performance oriented economies, the rule of law, the freedom of enterprise, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> also, I think interesting is to observe that uh, Switzerland and small Switzerland are consistently consistently ranked number one or two alternatively when it comes to global competitiveness and innovation and I hasten to say that my friend the countries are on this table are very close also on the top of that list of course but uh, the United States is blessed with the advantage of rich natural resources and the quality of its people, <clears throat> Switzerland has no 
natural resources. But still, uh, we have seen a remarkable economic success story since about 150, 200 years. The main criteria, according to experts in the field, for the Swiss economic success story can, be, can actually be summarized to two points. Point number one, the most important one, is stability. Stability in the political sense, stability in the social sense, stability foremost also in the legal and regulatory environment. That includes also predictability in legislation, in design of the framework conditions for investments. And that actually has been also part of the uh, reason why uh, Switzerland has been together with England and the Netherlands actually in the forefront of early, in, early industrialization already uh, at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. The point number two criteria uh, for the economic success story is education, training, and skilled workforce. I don't want to go into that, but the fact is, and most people would not know about it, is that Switzerland actually has most Nobel Prize winners uh, related to the per capita criteria worldwide. And uh, you wouldn't, pr pro I'm sure you, uh, nobody in this room would know that NASA's robots exploring the planet Mars now are powered by Swiss-made high-performance microelectronic engines of Swiss company called Maxon. Now, it's the actually economic relations between Switzerland and the United States are a success story for both partners. Switzerland is a very good customer of U.S. exporters. The U.S. exports to Switzerland are larger than those than from the United States to Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, and Austria combined. It may be surprising, but it is a fact or also larger than those to Russia and India combined. Still, at least, at least in 2008. We have to observe how that develops. In the field of investments, um, Switzerland is playing uh, 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 an, an important role, uh, more important than uh, you would actually attribute to the size of the country. We have 560 Swiss corporations with a presence in the United States. We have calculated that the cumulative investments of Swiss companies in the U.S. economy add up to 165 billion U.S. dollars. And these uh, investments stand for roughly 500,000 jobs in the United States, many of which, an overproportional part of these jobs, are attributable to the California economy. I refer to the pharmaceutical sector, to the biotechnology sector, also to food processing, and to various high technology, uh, high technology fields. We have in turn also 650 U.S. corporations in Switzerland, and uh, these investments stand for roughly 120,000 jobs created in Switzerland. So we have very close uh, economic relations. Now on the topic of ha at hand, Mr. Chairman, um, I think following up on the uh, excellent technical presentation by Mr. Joseph, I think I can be relatively succinct on this point, uh, on the discussion today. But having kindly been invited by you to this hearing, I owe it to you and to the other people present here to be very frank on this important issue. And please understand these comments coming from a friend and partner. Uh, the Water's Edge election represents the foreign investors in California an important, long-standing, as we have heard, and well-established compromise formula. Negotiate between, negotiated between major trading and investment nations and California, uh, and implemented as from 1987, as we have heard. Now, in my contacts with the heads of Swiss corporations and employers in California recently, because I'm relatively new here since six months only, I've visited many Swiss corporations in California, I uh, have sensed um, a certain degree of unrest and concern uh, with regards to the prospect of any possible erosion of the water's edge election. 
It is my impression, based on my numerous recent contacts and consultations with our investors, that any erosion of the Water's Edge election could give a, a negative signal to foreign investors, including those from my country. Now, uh, when, when I, what I think, what I feel is very revealing, Mr. Chairman, to me as a non-expert, is when I search the literature of experts in the field. Um, I have, I, it, it is quite interesting to, to see what is already written about the subject. And I quote, uh, for instance, CBS Money Watch, and this is not my language, I quote, uh, experts who are familiar with state tax issues are well aware of California's historically aggressive position regarding taxation of international businesses. It goes on, to date California's ambitions to tax international businesses have only been tempered by the Water's Edge election provisions, which were first passed by the California legislature in 1986 and subsequently amended. And I continue to quote, um, California's current fiscal straits arguably make international businesses with a taxable presence in the state, of, uh, in the state a potentially attractive target for tax administrators and the legislature. Accordingly, and this is very revealing, they say, it is important for those companies as well as those considering entry into California to observe further developments before they take uh, before they consider uh, further or new investments in California. Now, this is not my language. This is what I see is circulated now on the expert level of entrepreneurs when they take site selection decisions. Uh, may I add uh, on a more personal observation, uh, Mr. Chairman, that as a diplomat having covered economic affairs now for more than 30 years worldwide um, in all continents except Australia, um, I'm quite surprised that in a highly challenging economic environment in which we are all struggling to maintain existing jobs and are seeking ways to stimulate and promote the creation of new employment, critical changes to the well-established uh, compromise deals like the Water's Edge edition seem to be considered that would be perceived as hostile to international business and would, to say the least, not encourage further direct investments in the state of California, which I think would really be a pity, because we, our corporations uh, certainly want to continue to do business in California. And I am also surprised, you know, when I compare this trend to what I hear in other states in my uh, consular district here. I have just come back, actually, recently from Washington State, uh, particularly in Seattle area and also from Nevada and Utah, all of these regions um, are offering highly competitive uh, low tax or even no tax schemes, and uh, as my colleague from Luxembourg has mentioned, and these states are, by the way, engaged right now in a strong drive to diversify their industrial base, for example, into life science activities, now, I don't know uh, how, uh, uh, whether Nevada it would be now uh, particularly successful in that field, but they are aiming at that. But if you look at the Seattle area, I think we could really say that this is very serious competition also for California. To be sure, I do not want to be misunderstood. I, our corporations, and I speak on behalf of Swiss, uh, the heads of Swiss uh, companies in California, uh, they are glad to pay and are, of course, paying their fair share of taxes under the law. Uh, they are not asking for any special favors, but uh, they uh, would be unsettled uh, about the prospect of any surprises and unilateral changes in tax law. And as a friend, I just feel obliged to recall the most important realization supported by virtually all economic historians that one of the most important conditions for long-term economic growth and job creation are stability and predictability, including also, of course, a reliable legal and regulatory framework conditions. 
Well, okay. Um, surprises in that feed, of course. Um, investors don't want to have surprises. I mean, it's as simple as that. And I really appeal as a friend to continue, just to continue to apply the provisions of the Voters' Edge election and thereby maintain a stable, predictable, and reliable regulatory environment that investors so desperately are seeking. And which will, which will allow to continue to invest in California. Now, uh, in, if, if I have 30 seconds left, Mr. Chairman, please, please. I, I finally, since I promised to you to be very frank with you, uh, I have to add um, a, a one brief point on a more bilateral, of a mi more bilateral nature. Uh, because as a well informed chairman, uh, uh, I'm sure you have also heard that the United States and Switzerland have just recently successfully completed negotiations on a revised double taxation agreement between the two countries. Now, as a long story, I can in a separate meeting give you a much more about it, but you don't want to hear details now. But the fact of the matter is that Switzerland has, of course, in that process made far-reaching concessions. We are entering a new area of cooperation in the measures against tax evasion. Now, the reason why I bring this up is I have no choice, but the, matter, the fact of the matter is that right now, in the foreseeable future, uh, the ratification of this new double taxation agreement is pending in the Swiss Parliament. And we are expecting that the discussions will uh, hopefully materialize very soon in a ratification, hopefully in the June or summer session of the Swiss Parliament. It's a very delicate debate because some of the concessions have, to have felt to be relatively hurtful by some in my country. Uh, but I'm convinced personally, and also my government, that we are on the right track on that. Actually, the U.S. Treasury is very happy with the new double taxation agreement. Even the IRS is very happy. Who thought that that would be possible? But it is a fact. And we are all our American partners in, in the federal government and also in my government. We are desperately hoping to ratify that uh, double taxation agreement as soon as possible. Now. So I don't me, have to. Let me interrupt you. If please, I can. please, please. So you're trying to be, uh, as you said, uh, honest and, and and clear, and you're saying this double taxation agreement that is now pending before the Swiss Parliament. Part of it also incorporates uh, uh, measures to address tax evasion. Exactly. Um, and so, given the uh, California's work legislative work right now um, on this taxing matter of water's edge, do you think that would have an effect on the vote that Parliament would take on this greater? I really don't know, Mr. Chairman, but you know, I, I'm, I'm actually, I have a feeling that you as an experienced uh, senator, you could answer that question better than I can. But my concern... I haven't been to Switzerland in 20 <laughs> years. <so. laughs> You know my I'm concern. Yeah. You know one of the similarities we have. We are both. We are both. We both have federal uh, governments. We have both a two-chamber system, and we are both a very old democratic tradition. Now, what my concern is really. If you excuse to, me. Yeah. I'd like to welcome Senator uh, Gloria Negretti McLeod. Welcome, Senator. Thank you very much, Mr. My concern, frankly, is, and I'm very frank with that, my concern is that any bad news at this stage of the game, as I mean, human nature being as it is, also among parliamentarians in my country, is that any bad news on corporate taxation that might be interpreted as unfair or discriminating against foreign or Swiss for indirect investments in the United States, in this case in California, could at least have the potential of complicating the ongoing debate. This is my concern as a friend, and uh, this is, I, I, please forgive me for being so open, because I understand this is really an open exchange. It is a coincidence, of course, that this ratification procedure is up right now. 
And I have already two correspondents of major Swiss uh, newspapers who, who are interested in, in what is going on here because, you know, they are stationed in San Francisco and in the Silicon Valley. So um, that's my only concern that I wanted to raise on a bilateral basis, and forgive me for having taken a bit more time. Thank you very much for taking time to actually be here today. Thank, Thank you very much, sure. Chairman. Sure. Thank you, Chairman, for this opportunity to express uh, also our concern with the matter, a uh, concern that we share with uh, many, many other European countries not around this table today. And we expressed our concern also in a letter to the governor a few uh, weeks ago. And our concerns are very consistent with the issues that we raised already during the 80s, as was mentioned uh, before. Um, our country is not directly affected uh, by this uh, proposal of legislation. Um, we are no, uh, not a tax haven, uh, and we are not uh, listed. Um, the, um, the Netherlands and uh, are, in fact, uh, but that should be a mistake because they are on the uh, white list of the U OECD and their corporate uh, tax uh, is up to, uh, will raise up to 15% and, um, and they will skip um, also the economic free zones that are bothering some, uh, some parties in the, in, in the states as well. If you want any additional information about the Netherlands Antilles on taxation, I can give you. But uh, um, so if we are not directly affected, but nevertheless, there is a lot of concern. Why? As you know, Mr. Chairman, we like to say that we are pioneers in international business, and we are defending international business wherever because we strongly rely on international business for our economy. As you know, it goes for California as well. Um, remember the uh, hearing that we had a few months ago under your leadership in which uh, we all stated the importance of international trade and inter international investment for California. I might recall the fact that uh, trade with the Netherlands and, in and investments from the Netherlands counts for 75,000 jobs in, uh, in California alone. We are number five investor in this, uh, in this great state and around seven billion of FDI is, in, is involved. Um, but for our country as well, uh, foreign direct investments, especially from the United States, are very, very important. And there are many reasons why uh, a country can be attractive for foreign direct investment and international trade in a broader sense. First of all, as mentioned before, the stability and predictability. Of course, its location, its the quality of the workforce, its the innovation capacity. I, I, I won't mention all. Um, taxation, of course, is one of the uh, one can be one of the drivers, one of the reasons. But it's seldom uh, the main driver for an uh, for an investment. And if it if it is, you should really be a bit worried if it's if that's a good driver because investment that 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 are driven by are too much driven by taxation are very food loose uh, investments and a lot of countries around the world can share experience with that, that, that kind of um, investments with you. Um, a, a very important um, um, factor in uh, attracting foreign uh, investments in our opinion is uh, the openness of the economy and that's one of the success factors for, of, of the Netherlands of course in, in in attracting uh, investment from the um, from the United States and uh, and others, we have um, a broad range of um, of bilateral treaties on uh, on double taxation, avoiding double taxations, which are very helpful for for foreign investors. Um, and um, our our concern, or better to say, the, the, the concern of, of international businesses, of course, is that um, well, double taxation, of course, is very harmful for their for their business. Um, as I stated before, um, um, taxation should take place where uh, the e economic activity uh, takes place. It's a very important principle for international business. Um, and uh, 
we think that um, this um, this proposal is cannot only be harmful for California as such, but also could be a painful uh, precedent for um, for other states and, uh, and, uh, and and could be harmful for international business as a whole. I think uh, the uh, the unitarian method, as stated before, doesn't work in an in an in an international context in an in a world that is globalizing and it doesn't work in an open economy. We, of course, understand the concern uh, with the people that brought forward this uh, proposal, the concern about tax havens, and we share those concerns. But the solution should be found in an international context. And uh, for I like the OECD in, 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 in Paris is, is very helpful in this. Uh, unilateral steps are not very helpful in, uh, in this matter. Um, and uh, risk is well negotiated. What, are, what is at uh, election? It works. So why fix something that isn't broken? Um, I think only ye yesterday uh, we had a presentation of the um, of the governor um, uh, stating the importance of um, of. of um, of international trade in, 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 in California and, and I wrote my, my notice on this on this on, the, on this paper about um, the governor's initiative on uh, economic development and I, um, I was reading um, California is the number one state for attracting foreign direct investment. California is home to 51 fortune 500 companies and uh, and an well, just let me conclude. Calif the attractiveness of California, amongst a lot of other things, is that California is still a very open economy and strongly international connected via trade and investment. And we don't wa want to lose a, a partner like that. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to ask the, the panelists a general question. All of you here are not in the private sector, in the private public sector, so uh, you don't actually have any direct interest in any of these firms, private sector firms, and you're essentially here testifying as representatives of, of your government, of your different countries, to address trade relations, so to speak, between California and your respective countries. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Just want to make sure that we understand this panel is not about the private sector. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. Gloria, just to bring up to speed, we had the Franchise Tax Board uh, as first panelist speak on the Water's Edge tax law. We just had some uh, foreign representatives speak, and now we're going to have the private sector uh, come on out. Our third panel, of course, represented from uh, California Industries. If you can please come up, welcome. Some high-tech biotech uh, and some others. Welcome all, and, and I remind you to please introduce yourselves before you speak. Uh, for the record, your name and uh, who you represent. Mr. Chairman, I'm Don Lewis. I'm with Nestle. I'm their Assistant Director of State Taxes for their U.S. operations. And I want to thank you for your time and members of the board for their time to thank allow us Thank you to and welcome, Mr. Lewis. Just go ahead. Okay. I'm here as a representative of both Nestle first, and I'll get into it, but the Organization for International Investment. My employer, Nestle, is the largest food company in the world. 
uh, well known for its many businesses and brands, some of which you'll be familiar with, Carnation, Nesquik, Coffee Mate, Stouffer's Hot Pockets, Jenny Craig, Dryer's Ice Cream, Purina, Friskies, Gerber, Arrowhead, Calistoga. Obviously, you can see we run the gamut. We take you from birth right through, um, right through to your pet. I'm of age. I remember the advertisement for Nestle of Far Full the Dog, so that kind of gives you how long uh, Nestle's. There you go. <laughs> now, our principal. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Nestle has its principal headquarters in Glendale, California, and between all of our businesses, we employ 7,000 people. Is that California. your world headquarters or just uh, That's the U.S. operations. Okay. Uh, world headquarters is in uh, Switzerland. Okay. Um, we have, in addition to our headquarters, we have manufacturing facilities, distribution facilities, of course, the Jenny Craig Weight Loss Centers, and sales offices. We're very active in the local community. Uh, many members of our headquarter, headquarters are mentoring and tutoring students in about 12 ele elementary schools, which we've adopted. We're active in the R RIF program, which is, I understand is reading is fundamental, and we have provided over 1 million books uh, to this program. And as I stated earlier, uh, we are the company next door. We are a U.S. company. It's just that we're a little bit different in that we have a foreign parent. The second organization I do represent is the Organization for Foreign Investment. Um, it's a business association of U.S. subsidiaries such as ourselves with foreign parents. Most of, a lot of the companies are there, are many large international companies, which are household names, uh, which you'll see from the attached <coughs> list. And that group of companies insources 5 million jobs to the U.S., of which 572,000 are in California. We support a payroll in the United States. So your group uh, represents 572,000, Five million jobs in the United States, of which 572,000 are in California. The, about 10 percent. About 10 percent. That's 10%. correct. Okay. The payroll in the United States that we support is $400 billion. And against that would trade. 400 billion. In, in the U.S., of which 4 billion would be in California through all of these various. 4 billion companies. payroll in California. 4 billion payroll. I can't speak to investment because I don't have those numbers. Again, we're constantly insourcing. These companies are always insourcing into the United States and are always looking to continually insource in the United States to uh, take advantage of the resources that you heard about earlier. Mr. Joseph provided you the history on the water's edge. There was a lot of uproar back in the uh, 70s and 80s, so uh, it's not something that we have to go back into. But two of the reasons that it highlighted were the fact that worldwide combination substantially increases the risk of double taxation. And by double taxation, we mean the foreign company would be taxed in its home country and would be taxed in California. You also have the situation where we're required to restate all of our financial statements to put them in a U.S. Uh, financial um, presentation in order to accomplish this worldwide method of combination, something which the Water's Edge solved by giving us the opportunity not to have to do that. So you have additional costs which we must bear in order to satisfy any potential change to the Water's Edge election. And again, as you heard, the foreign companies uh, were up in arms about this. The U.S. government got involved. The U.S. State Department got involved. And we, you know, fast forward all the way to 2006, where we had the uh, regulation process, and the FTB did amend the regulation 25110. I won't bore you with the letters, which effectively said that any income that was not effectively connected to a U.S. business, meaning had no relationship to a U.S. business, would not be swept into the water's edge net. Now. As these changes and all of this conversation was taking place, a lot of this was prefaced on the fact that the FTB was concerned about the so-called abuses, the so-called what they pervade as loopholes, and they were worried about companies sending money abroad and that out of the reaches of taxation. In order to bring a comfort level to the state of California, we put right into that change regulation we put in the regulation something that specifically says if the transaction that's being questioned is specifically identified for the purpose of tax evasion, then the rules are off. 
you have a right to include that income. So we put that right into the regulation change in 2006. Not only do you have that in the regulation that deals strictly with the water's edge, you have many other tools. So this FTB has many other tools where they can attack these type of transactions. Um, you have tax shelter provisions. You have um, case law, which challenges transactions that don't have economic substance. So you have all of these tools available to you to attack these transactions, notwithstanding the fact that the U.S. government is always looking at these transactions, and any time they challenge a tax avoidance transaction and are able to repatriate the income back and tax it, California would be entitled to their share of this income. So it's not like you're alone in the battle. You have there are tools. There's uh, many mechanisms which will repatriate the income if it's a tax avoidance transaction. Now it was clear from 2006 that you wanted to maintain the integrity of the Water's Edge election. You knew that you had the um, understanding that any change to it would just create administrative burden, would just create confusion. So you said, okay. And we went back at the time, so we went back, and the legislative intent when it came in was not to include non-effectively connected income. So the legislative, and we're saying any departure from that is just going to create confusion on top of confusion. And I myself dealing with the compliance side of it at the same time as this side of it can tell you that trying to satisfy any change where it reaches past the U.S. operations is somewhat impossible to uh, accomplish. It takes an inordinate amount of time to get to some number, and any number that we would come up with would be subjective. It, it could never be accurate because you got translation gains, uh, you just got different methods of accounting, so it, it is pretty difficult to accomplish. So, as in sources, meaning the AFI companies, we are very concerned that the current proposal that's out there could change the Water's Edge election and require us to in include income, which has no relationship to California at all. And as you've heard earlier from many speakers, it would create a disincentive to potentially continue to invest in California, because one, we don't want the additional burden, and two, uh, we don't think it's fair to saddle us with the additional cost. So in conclusion, you know, any significant changes to the Water's Edge taxation, as we see it, would result in double taxation for the foreign company or foreign affiliates. It would unnecessarily strain ties and economic relationships with the rest of the world when at a time of economic downturn all of that cooperation is needed. California would be out of step with the rest of the states and even the United States' own international tax policies, and it would definitely be a clear disincentive um, for firms to invest in California and insource uh, jobs to California. So if you look at the four negative points, they add up to California not potentially not getting any additional investment and in the future not ending up with additional jobs, which are so critical now to your recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, my name is Greg Turner. I'm an attorney with uh, Nielsen Works here in Sacramento. I'm here today on behalf of the California Healthcare Institute. CHI is a research and advocacy organization that represents the interests of California's leading biomedical companies, uh, academic and research institutions, as well as uh, those companies that support the uh, biomedical community. Uh, biomedical is a growing industry in California. It's become really sort of a part of California's fabric, economic fabric. We, uh, in 2008, I think it was measured that we produce $80 billion in revenue. Um, we have about 180, 870 products in the pipeline. Uh, in that year, we employ 274,000 people in California, and if you if you expand that out to the companies that um, are related to or support the biomedical industry, where it's biopharmaceuticals and metal devi medical device uh, industry, laboratory services, um, that th those job numbers are, uh, approach three quarters of a million people uh, here in California. Uh, and so, you know, we, we certainly view our, our role here in California as, uh, as a bright one uh, and can w want to uh, contribute to California's uh, economic growth in the future. That, of course, requires uh, for us um, a uh, participation on the part of the state to have an environment that allows us to do that. So as a, a California-grown uh, uh, industry, we need the 
in, in this example, the uh, protections of the water's edge election that allow us to, uh, to, to grow globally um, without it. Um, is I think a number of speakers have mentioned before, prior to the water's edge election, uh, a lot of companies, uh, foreign, frankly, and domestic, viewed uh, worldwide combination as effectively double taxing their income. And that, w w it's been mentioned a lot, but the reason that happens is because not every country follows the same methodologies, either on accounting or tax purposes. So for measuring your, uh, your earnings and profits uh, on accounting or for tax purposes differs. And so those differing rules um, not only complex for a company to comply with, which is a huge cost on a global scale, um, but also uh, the, the differing rules overlap. Um, and so from a, 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 even from a California company's perspective, uh, as we grow uh, globally, um, that's critically important for us uh, to be able to continue as, you know, essentially a California-grown industry. There, there are some unique aspects to the uh, biomedical industry that are, I think are important to understand in the context of the Water's Edge 2 is that um, as we expand into foreign markets um, without the Water's Edge, uh, it becomes inc increasingly difficult for us to do that. We've got manufacturing requirements that that often require us to be in foreign countries. It's not simply about expanding into a market for, for cost reasons. We uh, often have to uh, ma manufacture uh, in, uh, in foreign countries, whether to be closer to the market, closer to our customers um, for the, the types of products we produce. It may have to do with the capacity or capability here in California um, or in the United States that simply doesn't exist. Um, and so we need to be in that, in those uh, foreign markets to be able to uh, do, uh, produce the products that we do. Um, and so um, we also have the, just the, the, the realization that in order for us to be, to be able to provide the products that we do to our customers, sometimes we need to be in that market physically uh, manufacturing in order to be able to do that. So it's not just a matter of as we expand globally that we can you know, manufacture and produce here in California and ship via FedEx. We have to actually have substantial presence in some of those foreign markets. So the water's edge operates as a way for us to be able to do that without substantially adding to our costs uh, and the complexity of, of our filing returns, which there again uh, now allows us to continue um, as essentially as a California headquarter companies. And so keep that in mind too, is we, we've talked a lot today about the, the impact on foreign companies that want to invest in California. It's also critically important to a lot of California industries who are trying to glow globally. Um, and I think that, that that global growth benefits California as well. You know, another, another unique aspect to the biomedical industry is, is our planning horizon. I think Mr. Joseph mentioned that the election on the water's edge is, is seven years because it roughly measures the business cycle. Well, in the biomedical uh, world, our planning horizon isn't even, you know, 10, 10 years. It's 20 and 25 years. Um, and so uh, because we've got to account for the, the research that goes into developing products, um, the extraordinary degree of testing that's involved um, in bringing products to market, and then ultimately the manufacturer and, uh, and, and marketing of products. And that happens over a very long period of time. And so uh, a couple of the words I think that speakers have used repeatedly today are uh, predictability and stability. <clears throat> so from a California company perspective, California-grown industry perspective, predictability and st stability are critically important to us because if, if we've measured our costs over a 20, 25-year period and there's been a substantial shift uh, in something as important as the water's edge, it, it impairs our ability to um, bring products to market in a profitable way. Um, and so uh, we certainly want to convey that message as well, is that the, the water's edge is important both in terms of uh, its protection, but in terms of its long-term stability. And, and the Water's Edge really has kind of stood up to that so far. Um, we have been, uh, I think Mr. Joseph mentioned, really the last major modifications were in 1994. Um, there's been tweaks here and there, and that, that happens from time to time, certainly. Um, but by and large, the Water's Edge has withstood uh, the test of, uh, of time and has provided a degree of predictability and, and stability for, um, for California companies. And, now I know that there have been time, there have been periods over the years where people have complained about uh, corporate loopholes or taxpayers taking advantage of of their tax positions, um, and I guess I would say it's it's been talked a little bit about uh, so far, but I want to at least repeat a little bit, which is 
there are plenty of tools in place for the state of California, the Franchise Tax Board, to uh, attack either abusive transactions or uh, specific taxpayers who are taking advantage of the system, whether it be in reliance on the federal government, which uh, is itself something important to understand. The federal government, as we've already heard, um, is in the position to be able to negotiate treaties with specific countries. Uh, and that's. I wanted to uh, interrupt you to introduce Senator Roy Ashburn. Welcome, sir. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Um, real quickly, I was just talking about the, um, the existing tools that the uh, state of California has in order to attack uh, or to address concerns about uh, tax avoidance. Uh, and we do have a, a great reliance on the federal government for their ability not only to negotiate treaties with foreign governments, but also their, their resources and auditing. We, we benefit, we sort of can piggyback off of uh, their auditing efforts of, of foreign companies. And so to the extent that adjustments are made, uh, those flow through the state of California. But California also has its own uh, tools available to it. Uh, we've talked a little bit about subpart F income. That was actually, go back to the history of, of the water's edge, that was the uh, that was the element included within the water's edge uh, to deal with uh, tax havens originally. Um, and so um, we have those tools uh, available to us uh, already. We also have whether it be transfer pricing rules or uh, in, in inverted corporations. We've, we've done a number of things, I think, to try to address any concerns that, that might exist in terms of uh, specific types of, of transactions. But we, what we don't want to see happen is that we allow the rhetoric of concern about businesses not paying their fair share uh, be used to undermine the what has been successful um, structure, a successful part of California's uh, taxation multinational companies in, in, in the water's edge. Um, so at least in terms of the, the message from the, the biomedical com community who has uh, companies who have uh, really grown up here in California and, and, and want to continue to do that, um, remember for us that the, the, the water's edge election stands for an ability for us to grow in foreign markets when we, we, we have to be in those locations um, in a lot of circumstances to, to be able to grow. That benefits our California companies, our, our, our California headquartered businesses, um, and that we need the stability and predictability of the water's edge uh, in order to, to make those sort of long-term commitments to our uh, product development. So Thank you very much. Quite welcome. Next speaker. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Michelle Peelsticker. I represent the California Taxpayers Association. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with Caltax, we represent about 400 large and small businesses on taxation and fiscal issues here in California. I'd really like to thank you, Mr. Chair, for convening this hearing today because it reminds us all of the original purpose of the Water's Edge election and just how momentous it was in staving off an international trade war. The history of Water's Edge is fascinating and it's illuminating. Um, the fact that it took 10 years and the great, <clears throat> excuse me, the great political minds of major players such as Willie Brown, Al Alquist, John Vasconcelos, and Tom Hannigan and others as well, which I, I've neglected to mention, to achieve the Water's Edge election is remarkable. But that's how important and complex the issue was. In the eyes of our foreign trading partners, absolutely something had to be done about mandatory, mandatory uh, worldwide combined reporting. Um, but attempting to fix what our trading partners viewed as taxation beyond our borders was like trying to fix a leaky pipe. And I want to add some context to what Mr. Joseph talked about earlier. Um, this was a very long process. We started with attempting a unitary reform in 1977 with a series of informational hearings. And we didn't get to the water's edge until 1983. The first bill wasn't introduced. We had other unitary reform measures, but water's edge didn't come until 1983. And it still took took until 1986 to get an actual bill. Um, I also want to uh, mention that with regard to that pie uh, that Mr. Joseph referred to, some of the issues that people had with unitary combined reporting and that pie was that there were distortions created um, based on currency fluctuations, um, based on how different countries 
uh, use payroll. So for example, we may have a large salary here, they may have a small salary and a huge benefit package uh, in another country. And those factors can be distortive if you're looking at them in a unitary sense. Um, uh, Although at, uh, by the 1983 came around, um, we could agree that a water's edge limitation was in order. Some of the things that still remain to be worked out were, for example, how do you treat uh, foreign dividends uh, and not be discriminatory against domestic corporations? So there was sort of a, an intercompany dispute between the foreign corporations and the domestic corporations. Um, other disputes arose as to whether to include 80-20 corporations, and I think the what we've done is we've said any, as uh, Mr. Joseph said, any corporation that has uh, more than 20 percent is included in the water's edge. Um, so we finally get to 1985 uh, with SB 85 Alquist. We almost have a bill in 1985, and then at the last minute a provision gets inserted for divestiture in South Africa, which kills the bill. So. We have a federally convened working group, numerous bills, lobbying by foreign delegations, a state-level working group, and then finally Assemblyman John Vasconcellos brokered a compromise. And that included the Water's Edge election, 75% foreign dividend relief, elimination of U.S. territories from the Water's Edge, and eliminating language on tax haven countries. Um, the New York Times at the time quoted an Assembly staffer saying it's a miracle bill and that both sides won. Um, we needed subsequent cleanup, as Mr. Joseph mentioned. But so there's so, so much talk today about limit, eliminating the Waters Edge uh, so-called loophole. But as the testimony today has demonstrated, the Waters Edge is anything but a tax loophole. It was a delicately, carefully crafted compromise enacted at the urgent, urging of our foreign trading partners and California businesses. And it's absolutely crucial to further investment in California. So tinkering with the Waters Edge edge election is the absolute worst thing California could do, either in this recessionary economy or even during an economic boom. It took too much to get us here. And as a member of the international community, it's even more crucial that California keep the water's edge election as is, lest we risk un undermining our relationship with our foreign trading partners and a brilliant compromise that was 10 years in the making. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, good morning. I'm uh, Fred Main. Uh, today I'm appearing here on behalf of TechNet. TechNet is one of the leading trade uh, groups uh, representing industry that promotes growth and technology in the innovation economy. TechNet companies represent 200 million jobs nationwide, and they include both established companies, which would be some of the uh, foundations of the technology economy here in California and some of the newest venture startups that will be the foundation companies of the future. Tax policy has been one of the key issues that impacts tech net companies and their investment decisions. And we, and we uh, certainly support uh, the current uh, ability of companies to make a unitary election. The current Water's Edge election ensures that domestic California companies are on an equal footing with their competitors. There's been a significant uh, discussion of the impact of uh, companies uh, that are uh, foreign companies operating here in California, and we certainly uh, welcome them. But it's important to remember that a big part of the unitary compromise uh, in um, the late 80s, early 90s was the ability of California companies, uh, do domicile uh, companies in the U.S., uh, to be treated fairly. That uh, the concerns that they were operating uh, in foreign company countries and that their income would be uh, disproportionately uh, taxed in relationship to their competitors, which was a major concern for the compromises uh, that uh, were put forward. Now, as Peel Sticker pointed out, the great minds of uh, the, the legislature that were involved in those uh, compromises, um, certainly not putting myself in in that level of of uh, political uh, the political pantheon, but but I was working on the unitary issue in the uh, 80s uh, for the business community, and I can just highlight that the concern over equal treatment was a key key part of the decision, and we we're very concerned uh, that um, any significant 
uh, changes to the water's edge and how it treats uh, foreign income or attempts to treat foreign income would be uh, a very uh, great concern. A couple of highlights as it relates to that, that um, while it's often looked at or can, a question is raised about the uh, jobs that or develop economic development that may occur in foreign countries, uh, tech net companies um, spend 80% of their budgets in the U.S., and uh, that is more than half of their uh, employees, so that uh, inside the water's edge of, Cal of the U.S., there's still a tremendous amount of economic activity. Uh, nearly 20% of all American workers work for companies with overseas operations. This represents more, of the, more than half of the U.S. manufacturing employment. And higher productivity leads to both to better jobs in the U.S. And so we, California is in a global economy, and we can't look at uh, California as just an island. We have to look at uh, California as our companies are competing across the globe and having to compete on a fair basis. Uh, finally, uh, one of the uh, issues that uh, is raised in a discussion uh, of um, whether to change the uh, water's edge uh, in any significant way is the uh, debate that started in the early 80s uh, really became driven for a number of the domestic and U.S. companies by the fear that foreign governments uh, would adversely tax California companies. And I think we always have to keep that in mind as we look to significant changes, that California, if it makes significant changes to the water's edge, what happens to then the uh, reopening of the debates uh, that were resolved uh, in the 80s and 90s? And we think that the current status quo uh, has uh, worked a very good balance, both for the investments in California and our ability of our members to compete internationally, and would encourage you to continue to preserve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Panelists, any questions from the committee? Thank you. I'm going to open it up for any uh, comments from the public, audience, anybody want to? It's a, it's a very important issue, though a bit complex for the non-tax uh, experts, but I think, again, very important. What I'd like to do uh, is uh, I'm going to go back and work with my committee and, and write up a brief summary of, of the information that was presented today and, and give it to some of the appropriate individuals in the legislature. Um, because today, um, not many, um, some of the other members of this committee not here today because of their conflicting schedules, but nonetheless, this is an issue that's important to California and the legislature, and we'll be sharing the information that all of you have presented here today with, with the rest of the interested parties uh, here in California. Uh, so with that in mind, again, I thank the members of the Senate that showed up today, members of this committee, as well as the audience for coming from as far as you did to be here and, and testify on this most important issue. Uh, if you uh, feel compelled to submit any more information, uh, please contact us, and I'm more than happy to include it as part of the record. Thank you very much, and, and have a good day. This committee hearing is adjourned. Right.